Imagine a place where children are not allowed to cry. Imagine a place where men are not allowed to sleep in their own houses. Imagine a place where women are forcibly assigned husbands. Imagine a place where mothers are forced to watch as their 12-year-old daughters are raped. Imagine a place where children are not allowed to cry. Imagine a place where men are not allowed to sleep in their own houses. Imagine a place where women are forcibly assigned husbands. Imagine a place where people who talk too much have their lips sealed with a padlock. A place where those who defy orders have their ears cut off. Imagine a place where mothers are forced to watch as their 12-year-old daughters are raped. Sasa mwenye alikuwa kwa mlanga amesimama tu hivi mguu na mtoto akataka kupitia kwa miguu yake ila atoroke na mimi wamenisimamisha pale nje. Huyo vile mtoto anaingiza tu kichwa hivi akafinya hivi na mtoto anaanka chini. Kwa anka chini na mmoja akasema haya kasi ile iko toa huyo mtoto amevaa suruali toeni yeye ati ni msichana mwingine akampapasa tu akasema ndio ati haya anzie kasi imagine a place where every wednesday women are rounded up and taken to the forest to be raped a place where death can come in the twinkling of an eye nikaona kisu Alafu wakamaliza kuchinja kumaliza wakichinja mtu alikuwa nalamba damu Yet this is no place in the imagination until 10th March 2008 this place was Mount Elgon district a place in the grip of such terror that even animals were not spared Colonel Stephen Boywa is the commander of the Army's 2nd Brigade brought in to reinforce the Okoa Maisha operation in Mount Elgon. Actually what you are seeing behind me was a big shopping center. There were shops on both sides of the road. Right now you cannot see even a single one. I think you, there there are only two remaining walls of what used to be the shops here. Completely it was flattened and they banned everything and it is not only this shopping center several others the path to kubura primary school is overgrown with grass from lack of use the buildings have been plundered the desks are stacked like firewood inside the staff room new textbooks lie strewn all over the floor 
unpleasant history has been erased. It is one of 17 schools closed in the wake of violence in Mount Elgon. Mount Elgon has not always been a place of conflict. Hemmed in by Transoya district to the east, Bungoma district to the south, and Uganda to the west, Mount Elgon district has fertile volcanic soil and a steady rainfall pattern that supports maize and vegetable farming. Its population of 150,000 people is managed through four administrative divisions, Cheptais, Kopsiro, Kapsokwonyi, and Kaptama. In Kopsiro division is the Chebuk settlement scheme, the crucible of the land conflict in the district. After settling 370 members of the Ndorobo community in the first phase of the Chebuk scheme in 1965, the government again carved out land to settle more people 22 years later. In the third phase of the scheme, 7,000 people who had been allowed to live on government land without title were shortlisted for allocation, but there were only 1,732 plots, each measuring two and a half acres. One man who had illegally allocated himself 200 acres of government land refused to take part in the vetting designed to establish deserving cases. Wycliffe Matwakei Kirui Komon, on rejection of the vetting exercise, drew a band of young men around him and with the support of a Sabaot cultural leader known as a Laibon, formed a gang that would become the self-styled Sabaot Land Defense Force. They began evicting those who had been allocated land in Chebuk Phase 3. Initially, the militia received the reluctant or forced support of the community, as Beatrice Chemengo, a businesswoman and farmer in Cheptais Division, recalls. <laughs> wakakosa mwelekeo wakaacha na mambo ya mashamba na wakaanza mambo ya unyang'anyi mambo ya uwaji mpaka hata tukashindwa sasa ili kutetea shamba ama ni juizi na uwaji kwa sababu walifika mahali kabisa sasa wakaingilia bibi na bwana wakigombana kwa nyumba hao ndio wanafanya hiyo kesi jirani mkisumbuana kwa mpaka wa shamba sasa ni hao Men were forcibly recruited into the militia. Kelvin Jeffrey Chepkurui, Fred Jumba, alias Mwala, Raphael Ndiema Chemia, were all forcibly conscripted into the militia. Many others were kidnapped and conscripted into Matwake's rapidly growing gang of unwilling but terrified soldiers. Slowly, an oppressive air began to descend on the entire district as Matwake tightened his grip on the force. The men are believed to have taken an oath administered by the Laibon. I think all things must have taken place. But I did not see. But I want to say it must have. Because when you look at what some people are doing, like what? You, you, you just, because somebody who's just all right, all of a sudden becomes almost like a lion one. Nafikiri vijana hawa kwa sababu ya hii mtu anaitwa Laibon kama aliwapatia dawa ambayo walikula kiapu na ikawaleweza so walikuwa wajali chochote kwa sababu awe mama yake awe baba yake anamuona awe mama yake anaweza kumjiza na imefanyika hivyo kwa sababu mtu anakuwa wild hata wewe huwezi cheza na yeye anakuwa wild the effect of the oath did not escape the keen eye of Salome Chepkirui Ndiwa Matwake. Kwa sababu kwa hakika, hii mzee amewalisha watu wote kiapo ambao hata haistahili katika dunia hii. Kwa sababu ungewana mtu angekuchinja pila kushutuka, hata mimi nilipikwa na bwana yangu mpaka akanifunja. Na acha hai nipika tangu tuwaone. Lakini juzi alinipika nusu ya kifo mpaka mkono kukafanya nini kukafunjika. Hapo nikawasa Police spokesman Eric Kiraide believes that however genuine their grievances might have been, Matwake and his gang chose a path fraught with peril and they were doomed to fail. The people of Mount Elgon now have seen what happens 
when people attempt to solve otherwise legitimate grievances. The grievances on the land, we are very sure, are legitimate. The, the nucleus is an attempt to solve legitimate grievances using illegitimate means. By March 29, 2007, some 45,720 people had been displaced and another 94 killed in the violence. Residents of the three locations had been turned from proud farmers and workers into exiles who depended on relief food, not knowing what daybreak or nightfall would bring. On April 23, 2007, six men were flushed out of their houses, their hands tied with ropes, stood in the middle of the Kinyoro Kisawai Road in Transoya district, and shot dead. Twelve days later, another nine people who had fled Mount Elgin were shot dead in Matisi in neighboring Transoya district. Matwake's group hunted them down. After taking the oath, no one was allowed to quit the force. A special team of police officers was sent to the area, but the residents had already been terrified into silence. On May 31, 2007, two General Service Unit officers were killed as they investigated Leaflet's warning of trouble on Madaraka Day. The militia had started to slowly cut off the flow of information, as Evelyn Chamachep Karam remembers. Faith Chepkwonyi's husband was kidnapped and taken to the forest. Soon the local government officials were cut off the much-needed flow of critical information that could have assisted law enforcement officials combat the menace caused by Matwake's ruthless gang. Peter Keen Kiboy, the acting chief of Kapka 10, testifies. Administration wakati wakati hao walikuwa natafuta watu kuhua, atukwa spared. Sisi pia walikuwa najua, sisi ndio the source of the information kwa government. Wakawana kuwa mbata sisi pia tutimuliwa. Sababu tulitishwa wengi kabisa, hata mbaga sasa. The chiefs wengi bado wana reside from outside the locations. Kwa sababu pia walitishwa na wakambiwa atutake wati ya serikali hapa. Kiboy was present when the chief of Kapka 10 location was killed on October 26, 2007. So ikawanekana chief wa makufu. So kuenda kumuona amepikwa tisazi nyingi zana kwa mkongo. Chief Sonit was the second administration official to lose his life at the hands of the militia. Assistant Chief Shem Cherowo had been killed by the same militia months earlier. As local administrators from village headmen to chiefs either fled or were rendered powerless by forbidding residents to speak to them, the militia's extortion, taxation and mutilation regime quickly took root. They set up a parallel government. Now I got a share of the government. I got a share of the government. I got a share of the government. I got a the militia became so brazen that they would roam the villages in broad daylight, demanding taxes and taking away defaulters and other perceived transgressors. I witnessed this one teacher that uh, was kidnapped. And as we are talking right now, he's nowhere to be seen. We don't know whether he's dead or what. We constructed a bridge here, just a... Uh, makeshift bridge and then they confused that we, had, we were making the bridge to make the security come in so fast and so he was supposed to have to have even been fined so for all that time we have been very uneasy with them kangaroo courts were set up in the forest to try all sorts of cases they gave their verdicts now beatrice jamengo gives hers <laughs> See justice when you are so mere sheria, so nana. You look on Yama, the Duluma, Kabisa. 
Irene Kaboy's ear was cut off by her own nephew. Alice Chemos Yongok also lost her ear. Benjamin Niuno Tachoni too knew the experience firsthand. Na alikata kwa sababu nilikata kutoa ile registration fee yani ile pesa walikuwa wanahitaji ya shilingi 200. In Kapka 10 location alone, 23 people have reported having their ears cut off for allegedly being drunk, lateness in remitting their taxes, or leaving their homes for unknown destinations. More chilling summons were issued and frightful forest trials held. Unspeakable crimes were committed. Every Wednesday, women would be rounded up and taken to the mountain. Some never returned. The survivors deserve privacy and protection. Faith Chepkwonyi spotlights the horror of what used to happen. Ata chief hakuwa na say, assistant chief hakuwa na say, sasa kitu kilioko alikuwa tu wanakuja, ikiwa ni mimi sasa mimi nimekupenda na kuambia tu leo, na ni hapo hata sasa zingine hawakuwa naenda na wengine huko juu, kwa sababu wale walikuwa naenda huko juu, maybe kama walikuwa wanarepiwa, wanarepiwa na kuchinjwa jane whose identity has been altered in this documentary was attacked robbed threatened with rape and ultimately forced to watch helplessly as her 12 year old was defiled by the militia nikanyamaza nikasema simu ni same jameni ati toa nguo toa nguo na ulale chini alafu mmoja akasema usiende cheptais Ukienda cheptais tutakufata. Hospitali ya cheptais tutakufata na ujue hiyo siku wewe tutakuchinja. On December 31st, 2007, at around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Evelyn Chemachep Karam, who lives on the edge of the Mount Elgon forest in Kimama, saw her neighbors being marched into the forest. Punde tu kidogo ninaona watu wanaanza kupita. Wameyafungwa makono. Wanapandisa, wanapandisa. Ingawaje uoka ili nifanya. Bila niliona huyo mzee Jackson Mafura. Nilika ya baba yangu alikuwa ananipenda sana. Nikashutuka. Na mama ya kwake, na kijana yake, na wanawake ya tawaya, na bibi ya kijana yake ya huyo mzee. Nikashituka sana. Si kuwezaabu walikuwa wangapi. Lakini kesho yake mi nasikia hawa watu wote walichi. Na wenye walikuwa wanajidai ni wale watu walichinja hawa watu. Vijana wenye walichinja hawa watu. This 16-year-old girl, Nasimiu, was in the group that was frog-marched into the forest with a lost gaze in her eyes. She recalls what she saw. Ilikuwa mechimba kila mtu shimo laki. So waka shangazi yangu waka anza kumpanga na mama yangu mwingine na nduku ya baba mwenyaliwa shangazi yangu. Waka anza kuchipanga kwa hiyo shimo. Waka sema uyo msichano waka hapa ukingoja uyo mama. Hafu mi ni kaka waka kichinja waka maliza. Kichinja mtu walikuwa nulamba damu. Dixon Simiu Wanyonyi had watched his relatives killed. Sasa nikiwa nikiangalia wenzangu, babu, ndugu zangu, baba wangu wadogo wamekufa. Sasa mimi nikasema, hii kifo ya kuchinjwa ama kukatwa sitaweza. Ni heri ni hepe. Ikiwezekana nikimbia hata kama ni sasa wanishtua lakini sitaweza mambo haya. Wakati nilikuwa nimejaribu kukimbia walikuwa wamefunga hizi mikono. Katakambe as he fled, fate intervened for those left behind. 
The survivors recount of an order issued by an unknown person that enough people had been killed and the remaining two members of the family should be spared. As Matwake's force grew in size, so did its ruthlessness and brutality. Everybody was being watched as the militia had established cells all over the areas they controlled. Francis Maiwa Naktar had been forcibly appointed chairman of his village. For his conscientiousness, he received a chilling letter. Then he was summoned to the court in the forest. Although Naktar's life was spared, it was at a price. A six-inch nail was hammered into his backside. Neither he nor the other victims of the mutilations could seek medical help. It was strictly forbidden. On March 3, 2008, members of the Sabaot Land Defense Force attacked Embakasi village. They burned 10 houses and killed 13 people, among them children aged between 3 months and 10 years. With Matwake's gang growing in confidence and the atrocities, murder, plunder spreading fast beyond and over 613 people killed, Calls for a heavy, unambiguous reaction from government were unmistakable. It was time. The Commissioner of Police is the principal internal security agent to suspect. But he has all these resources through the proper government procedures to gain records, to ask for assistance from the military, to ask for enforcement. On March 10, 2008, a joint operation force comprising the Army, the General Service Unit, and the administration police arrived in Mount Elgon, a forested terrain with shocking logistical challenges. Colonel Stephen Boywar, 2nd Brigade Commander, led the Army's reinforcement for the operation. Um, our first target were the caves. There was a cave in the forest. We knew they were training, and a training camp called Kamasat and Jeburbur Cave. Those are our first targets. The operation has had its challenges. Colonel Boywar candidly acknowledges some of them. They got wind that we were coming. And so where we expected to find them, we never found them. They had moved deeper into the forest. And those in the villages have moved to adjacent villages. Although fear had ruled the lives of the residents for a long time, the joint force is fast winning public confidence. I would say terror. Uh, the repercussions or, or the, the, what they used to do to those people they suspect were giving away information was, I, don't, I can say, terrible. Uh, they killed, they chopped ears, um, they tortured, and they even raped. They do all sorts of things, things you cannot believe. That turnaround is what has yielded results in such a short time. That's why uh, in the first three days, we only managed to arrest 72. But the next, the fourth day, we did a cordon and search around Jephthah's. We rounded up 710 male adults. And at the end of the day, we were able to single out 104 SDLF suspects. In spite of the initial success, 40 days later, the gang leaders stay a step ahead of the military operation. Tracking Matokwe's gang through the caves and forested mountain is proving to be no easy task.
but two months after the start of the joint operation, Wycliffe Komon Matoke is cornered and killed deep inside Mount Elgon Forest as he engaged with the joint operation force in a shootout. Well, in the Ajin Faya Kwamba, here in Wycliffe Matoke, was a baby alama kalikwa naiki juani. Only three days before his death, his widow had unsuccessfully appealed to him to surrender. Cheptais was chock-a-block with people who flocked the center to confirm that indeed, the man whose name could only be mentioned in whispers, Wycliffe Matwake, had been killed. As members of the militia continue to turn themselves in, the police are clear about the task ahead. We must hold those people accountable for their criminal acts. How does the Joint Forces assess its conduct on this operation? Colonel Boywo says, We've done our job professionally and uh, we've not answered to those because at the end of the day, the truth will prevail. We have the code of conduct, we have international practice which guides the conduct of operations like these ones. And we know that we are within the international standards of dealing with a situation similar to ours. If you took time off to study similar situations elsewhere in the world, you will know that we are actually very lenient. This operation has been very lenient, but also it has been so well planned that so far the military, the security forces have not suffered any casualties. For the armed forces, the lessons from this operation are being put to immediate use. If we improve on our security along the border, and especially now that we've uh, decided to, to put up a military base here in Mount Elgon, we will use that to train in Mount Elgon Forest. And I believe once we utilize the forest for training. Um, nobody will have the freedom of you utilizing that forest again. A lush green is beginning to wash over the blood that has been spilt on Mount Elgon in the past two years. The farms are coming alive again, and the people, once banned from seeking medical attention, are trooping to the health centers again. Gina. Gina. Major Dr. Michael Wakaba has been heading the medical aid team in the Mount Elgon area. I have a team of uh, 63 people uh, headed by a surgeon uh, who runs the theatre at our base camp located at Marakisi. Uh, the diseases differ among the various people. For example, women, we were treating uh, a lot of venereal diseases. Um, some aspects of claims of rape which were untreated for months, gonorrhea, syphilis, all those kind of venereal diseases. Besides restoring security and health, the military has also embarked on several missions of mercy. The entire region is being opened up. The residents are fulsome in their praise. Ata sahi mutu kika ata ukilala mulango wazi utalala mbake pamba suke kwa sababu tunawana serikali. Sahi sasa ni tunawana raa sasa na manamuga yako. Naongea sasa kama kawaita sasa. Tuko sasa. Ata watu wa meansa gurutu kwa poma kwa sababu watu walikuwa metaroka kwa erji. Hawa wanajishi tangu wa ingie. Uwa wanalenga mtu mwenye wanataka. Mtu kama hauna makosa, hawashuguliki na wewe. Hawa wanajeshi. Tangu wanze operation ya waza sana hapa tawe. Hawajaibia mtu. And hoping, praying that their nightmare is not about to recur. The operation shall continue as long as it detects. And even the investigation shall continue as long as it detects. Prosecution shall continue as long as it takes until 
justice is seen to be done. Life is returning to Mount Elgon. One by one, people are trickling back to their homes to revive the once desolate farms. There is a stubborn resilience in their faces and a stony enduring of pain and loss. But they seem determined to get back their lives. It is sunset in Cheptice town. Three days after the display of Matoke's body, it is a confident, relieved, yet still a limping town. The residents of Cheptice close the day heading to sleep at the foot of Kenya's second highest mountain, an impressive extinct volcanic mountain whose last and natural eruption has gone quiet, but left in its wake chilling scars and pain that the residents have silently borne for the last 18 months. They don't say it loudly, but it's written all over their walk, the tone of their voices. While popular opinion may point a return to a normal life, the people of Mount Elgon know a bitter truth, that the real work of healing this community and reintegrating it back into the rest of Kenya's society is, however, just beginning.